dear students welcome to the next lecture of wireless communication so today we will uh, continue our discussions uh, about the cellular wireless networks uh, in the last class if you recall uh, we were discussing about the cellular networks in general uh, we we <clears throat> did the concept of frequency reuse uh, we talked a little bit about the cellular system architecture um, we discussed about handoff and power control and then we uh, started discussing about traffic engineering and we had a short discussion about this Arlen B formula okay so this was the formula that we saw at the end of the last lecture so we, this is the probability of blocking in a lost call cleared system assuming uh, that the number of users are infinite and a is your offered traffic in our lungs n is the number of servers and if you know them then you can write down the expression for the probability of blocking which is sometimes also called grade of service so uh, today we will uh, continue our discussion um, about cellular networks we will first uh, do a problem uh, we will solve a problem together that applies this Arlen B formula for probability of blocking um, and, and, and it gives you an overview of cellular systems design and then we will proceed with the other concepts of cellular networks especially we will learn more about uh, CDMA and 3G systems in today's uh, in, in this lecture um, and uh, and maybe in the next lecture so let's let's see how we uh, how we go so so this is the problem okay so this problem let's solve it together so let's say we have a seven cell system okay covering an area of 3100 square kilometer okay and the traffic in the seven cells are given as follows okay so the traffic in our lungs are given for each cell okay <clears throat> so these are the traffic in our lung each user generates an average of 0.03 hour lengths of traffic per hour with a mean holding time of 120 seconds okay so the system consists of a total of 395 channels and is designed for a grade of service of 0.02 okay so determine the number of subscribers in each cell okay so uh, let's uh, let's proceed one by one so in each cell the traffic in our lungs are given okay and here it is said that the each user generates an average of 0.03 hour lengths of traffic per hour with a mean holding time of 120 seconds okay so in that case um, um, the number of subscribers will be simply the traffic in each cell divided by this number which is your uh, the average uh, traffic per hour okay so if you divide all these numbers you will get the number of subscribers in each cell so 30.8 is the R traffic in our lung for the first cell so if you divide this number by 0 0.03 then you will get something like this okay so this will be roughly equal to 1026 okay similarly you can calculate for the next cell and so on and then you can get all the values 
that you require for your part A. Determine the number of subscribers in each cell. So we have we have these numbers. So so it's it's it will be practical to convert these numbers okay to the nearest whole number okay so you can take the ceiling function of all these numbers this table gives you the numbers in decimal but these are number of subscribers so it's better to express them using the ceiling function okay so if you take the ceiling of 1026.7 the value for the first cell then this is basically 1027 okay uh, and, and so on okay so <clears throat> so for the next part part b let's see determine the number of calls per hour per subscriber okay so for this you are given the holding time 120 seconds so so you have to use that 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 input information so basically your offer traffic a is equal to lambda times h okay so so your lambda is a over h okay so a is given according to the problem okay um so these are the traffic in Ireland's okay uh, that was given and uh, <clears throat> sorry the a the traffic uh, each cell um, sorry each user generates an average of 0 0.03 Ireland's of traffic per hour okay so you are asked to find out the number of calls per hour per subscriber so in this case your a is 0 0.03 okay so your a is 0 0.03 this is the amount of traffic uh, that is generated um, on the average per hour for each user okay so therefore your a in this case is 0 0.03 and the average holding time is 120 second but here in the problem you are asked to find out number of calls per hour okay so you convert the 120 seconds into hour by dividing it with 3600 the number of seconds in one hour okay and that number uh, is your h and you find out lambda by doing a over h where your a is 0 0.03 so eventually you will get 0 0.09 so this is the number of calls per hour per subscriber or in other words each subscriber is generating on the average 0 0.9 number of calls per hour okay so that's that's the answer to part b in part c it is asked to, uh, to determine the number of calls per hour in each cell okay so this is basically multiplying the results of part a by 0 0.9 okay so 0 0.9 is the number of calls per hour per subscriber okay and you have total number of subscribers are these numbers that you have calculated in part a so number of calls per hour per cell will be the total number of subscribers in each cell multiplied by the number of calls per hour per subscriber so all the results of part a if you multiply by 0 0.9 then you will get all these numbers so these are the number of calls per hour per cell okay so now moving on um, with part d determine the number of channels required in each cell okay so in this case uh, you have a hint here you will need to extrapolate 
this using table p1 so basically um, you have to use the r and b formula so you have to use this formula <coughs> divided by so this was your R lang B formula so in this case your A is known you have you have found out um, um, <coughs> from part uh, C okay number of calls per hour in each cell okay so your P is given which is 0 0.02 so you have to find out N basically so to do that um, it's 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 not easy to just find out N from this formula so always you have to use the Arlen formula table okay to find that so let's uh, let's see so this is the table that you have so usually in all problems associated with the Arlang B formula you will be provided with this table okay sometimes you can find the Arlang B formula calculator from the from the internet okay but um, you can also use uh, the tables that are provided like this okay so this table gives you for a particular p okay so let's say in our problem p is 0 0.02 okay so we are basically interested in this column okay so for a particular p these are the numbers that you have for your a okay the offer traffic and these are the number of channels or the number of servers that you would require to generate this amount of traffic for this particular value of p okay so so these are other values of p so for each value of p you have all these numbers of a for a particular n according to this formula okay this formula involves only three parameters a n and p okay and all these are given in this table so for a particular p you can find a particular n for a particular a okay so if p and a is given you can find n if p and n is given you can find a if uh, n and a is given you can find p so this table is very useful so for for this problem uh, for part d we will use this table okay so you are asked to determine the number of channels required in each cell okay so <clears throat> so so the table in the problem statement actually gives the value of a okay so the problem statement is is giving you the value of a the traffic in our lines okay these values are given okay so so to calculate n from these values with this particular p 0 0.02 you can use this table so so let's say the first value is 30.8 okay so for 30.8 we have to look here in this um, in this table for this particular grade of service of 0 0.02 you have uh, almost 31 so 30.8 is very close to 31 so for this particular value of a you have this value of n okay so this is the mapping so you can find the number of channels for the first cell to be 40 for the second cell let's say you have <coughs> you have 66.7 okay so if you look into this column for p equal to 0 0.02 you won't find any value equal to 66.7 but you can see that 66.7 lies between these two values 
okay 59.13 and 87.97 and these are the values 70 and 100 corresponding these two so <coughs> you can use one thing you can use a linear extrapolation okay so let's say this is a non-linear formula okay for a for fixed value of p maybe if you plot you know if you plot n versus a okay so this will you know give you um, an exponential curve okay so let's say this is for p equal to 0 0.02 for other values of p you will get let's say other uh, curves like this so this maybe let's say this is p for p equal to 0 0.01 okay so let's say we are we are focused for p equal to 0 0.02 so let's look into this curve and let's say you are you want to find out uh, what is the value of n for a equal to 66 okay so let's say here is my 66 so 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 our, this value of n is what we are interested in okay let's say this is 66 66.7 actually so so you you have these two values okay so let's say this is 59.13 according to the table let's say this is 59.13 okay and let's say this is your 87.97 okay so this is your 87 point Nine seven, okay. So you can imagine that this portion of the graph between fifty nine point one three and eighty seven point nine seven is a linear graph, okay. And if you if you find out the equation of this straight line between fifty nine point one three and eighty seven point nine seven, then you can find out what will be the corresponding value of n for this 66.7 value of a okay so basically you are trying to find out the equation of the straight line so you uh, let's say you can do that like this so a minus 59.13 divided by n minus 70 okay so for 59.13 the value of n is 70 and then you can do uh, 87.97 minus 59.13 divided by 100 so for 87.97 the corresponding value of n is 100 so 100 minus 70 so from this linear extrapolation formula you can find an equation involving a and n okay so so let's say whatever be that equation now in that equation uh, that will be the equation of a straight line involving a and n in that equation if you put the value of a equal to 66.7 then you can find out the value of n okay so so if you put a equal to 66.7 here okay then you can find out the corresponding value of n which will be roughly equal to 78 okay you can check that yourself similarly for all other values you can find out the value of n by looking into this table okay so the next value of a is 48.6 so 48.6 according to this is between 31 and 59.13 so you can again use a similar linear approximation to find out the value of n corresponding to 48.6 um, and you will get that as 59 so in that way you can get all these values so you do the remaining yourself and verify um, your solution with these numbers that are given here okay so let's move on for part e in the part E, it says determine the total number of subscribers. So the total number of subscribers is basically 
all these numbers that you have if you sum them all then you will get 9597 the total number of channels required you can get from here from part d if you add all these values 40 plus 78 plus 59 and so on you will get 358 okay so average number of subscribers per channel part f so average number of subscriber per channel is total number of subscribers divided by total number of channels as simple as that that will give you 26.8 then part g asks you to find out the subscriber density so you have these many subscribers over a total area of 3100 square kilometer so you have 3.1 subscribers per square kilometer the total traffic is equal to the sum of the values from the table in the problem statement so, so that is basically all these all these numbers okay so if you sum them up you will get total traffic as uh, 287.9 Ireland's. Next, in part I, they ask you to find out determine the Ireland's per square kilometer. So, the total Ireland traffic is 287.9 divided by 3100 uh, square kilometer will give you 0 0.09. And then finally, what is the radius of a cell? So we assume that we have hexagonal geometry so the area of a hexagon of radius r is given by this okay so we have seven cells so for each cell the area is 442.86 so therefore from this you can find out r as 13 kilometer okay so so this is uh, this is the example of a problem for cellular system design we will do more examples like this in some tutorial uh, later but let us now move on and look into the other topics that we have for this lecture so so we are talking about cellular uh, mobile networks so the so we we saw that uh, the cellular networks or cellular mobile systems they are divided into different generations so the first generation systems were analog in nature and um, the standard for that was named advanced mobile phone service or AMPS so in North America there were two 25 megahertz bands allocated to AMPS one for transmission from base station to mobile unit another for uh, mobile unit to base station and each band was split into two to encourage competition and frequency reuse was exploited so the AMS operation is almost similar to what you saw in the last uh, lecture uh, the subscriber initiates call by keying in the phone number and presses send key the MTSO verifies the number and authorizes the user the MTSO issues message to user cell phone indicating send and receive traffic channels and then MTSO sends ringing signal to the called party. Once the party answers, the MTSO establishes circuit and initiates billing information. Either party hangs up uh, and then the MTSO releases the circuit, frees the channels and completes the billing. So you can see the first generation of mobile phones they use the circuit switching okay so here we are mentioning about circuits establishing of a circuit and releasing of a circuit so so this was a feature of the first generation of mobile phones where circuit switching was used later on you will see in in second generation onwards um, packet switching was used so so the difference between uh, first and second generation systems uh, so in in the first generation systems they are almost purely analog the second generation systems are digital in nature okay uh, also all second generation systems provide encryption to prevent eavesdropping second generation digital traffic also allows for detection and correction of errors giving clear voice reception 
and the channel access for second generation systems were dynamically shared by a number of users okay so um, <clears throat> so there was another system within the within the first generation which was called global system for mobile communications or gsm so this used fdma or tdma approach and it was developed to provide a common second generation technology for europe uh, my apologies gsm is a second generation system uh, i just i just told gsm is a first generation system so this is a second generation system and it was developed to provide a common second generation technology for Europe. Uh, the mobile station communicates across the UM interface, which is the air interface with base station transceiver in the same cell as mobile unit. The mobile equipment, which is the physical terminal, such as a telephone or a PC. Uh, this includes radio transceiver, digital signal processors and subscriber identity modules or SIMs. Um, GSM subscriber units are generic until SIM is inserted and the SIMs actually roam not necessarily the subscriber devices. Okay, So as a user of mobile phones you know what is a SIM and also you can appreciate that um, the SIMs roam not necessarily the subscriber devices. You can put them in any device and, and it can work so this is the gsm architecture so we were mentioning about the um interface so this is the interface between the mobile uh, equipment and the base station subsystems so this is one mobile station this is another mobile station each mobile station will have you know a mobile equipment and a, and a sim and then they communicate through the um interface to the base station in the base station you have different parts so the you have base transceiver stations the base transceiver stations are connected directly to the mobile equipments and then the base transceiver stations communicates with the base station controller through the abc interface and and then the base station controller communicates to the mobile switching center through the A interface okay and the mobile switching center is part of the network subsystem which also contains other uh, modules like operation and maintenance center data communication network and then these uh, different types of databases like VLR, A AUC, EIR and HLR we will go through the details of these uh, in, in the upcoming slides but this is the overall picture of the GSM architecture. And then the mobile switching center is also connected to the public uh, switch telephone network or the landline network that that is that you all have all in your homes maybe. Um, so <clears throat> so let's look into the different components of the GSM architecture. So base station subsystem, this consists of a base station controller and one or more base transceiver stations. So each base uh, transceiver station defines a single cell. And these includes uh, your radio antenna, radio transceiver and the link to a base station controller. The base station controller reserves radio frequencies, manages handoff of mobile units from one cell to another within the base um, station subsystem and controls paging. Then comes the network subsystem which you saw also in the picture. So the network subsystem provides the link between the cellular network and the public switch telecommunication networks or PSTN as you saw. So this is the network subsystem and it, it, it provides a connectivity between the mobile network and the public switch telephone network and the several functions of the network subsystem are uh, controlling of the handoffs between cells in different BSSs, the authentications of users and validation of their accounts, uh, enabling of worldwide roaming of mobile users etc. 
and the central element of the network subsystem is the mobile switching center okay so you saw that before this is the central element of the network subsystem the mobile switching center um, it has several databases so so as i as i mentioned here so these are the these are the databases okay so let's see what are their roles and functions so the hlr or the home location register database this stores information about each subscriber that belongs to it so these these actually store the information of all the home subscribers and the visitor location register or vlr they maintain information about the subscriber currently physically in the region so they are outside subscriber they might be roaming and they are currently within uh, within the region so the vlr will maintain the 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 location of all these visitor subscribers the authentication center database or auc these are used for authentication activities and they hold all these encryption keys uh, and, and, and all the security and authentication related uh, stuff the equipment identity register or eir this keeps track of the type of equipment that exists at the mobile station okay so whether it's a whether it's a cell phone or it's a it's a tablet or a pc etc now comes the con uh, concept of the gsm radio link so the gsm radio link uh, uses a combination of fdma and tdma and also uses 200 kilohertz carriers each with a data rate of 270.833 kbps and eight users share each carrier the gprs or the generalized packet generalized packet radio service uh, this is the phase two of gsm this provides a datagram switching capability to gsm so instead of sending data traffic over a voice connection which requires setup, uh, sending data and tear down. GPRS allows user to open a persistent data connection. This also has a new system architecture for data traffic. 21.4 kbps from a 22.8 kbps gross data rate is allowed and can combine up to eight GSM connections to provide a overall throughput up to 171.2 kbps um, there is another um, another you know uh, enhancement of this gsm called edge which is which is called enhanced data rates for gsm evolution so this is the next generation of gsm and uh, this is not yet 3g but uh, sometimes it was called 2.5g okay so in this case we have enhanced data rate as the name suggests so up to threefold increase in data rate uh, so you uh, you can see they are using up to three bits per symbol for 8 psk from one bit per symbol for gmsk for gsm so so in gsm they were using one bit per symbol in this case uh, for edge they are using three bits per symbol for 8 psk so there is a threefold increase in the data rate and maximum data rates per channel would be uh, 22.8 times 3 that is 68.4 kbps per channel and using all eight channels in a 200 kilohertz carrier the gross data transmission rate would be 547.2 kbps and and this this is the maximum actual throughput would still be up to 513.6 a later release of edge called 3gpp release 7 increased downlink data rates over 750 kbps and uplink data rates over 600 kbps so so now we will slowly move into the concepts of 3g but before that uh, we should study uh, the concept of spread spectrum 
and CDMA. Okay, so these are the building blocks of 3G systems. Okay, so uh, you have so far come across FDMA and TDMA. Okay, uh, so you can have <clears throat> different frequencies carrying uh, your data, and that is called FDMA. You can also use the time axis and and use different time slots to carry your data and that is called TDMA. In case of CDMA, you can uh, you can use different codes, okay. So, so all these codes, uh, they can use the same frequency, okay, but uh, they are orthogonal to each other, okay. So we will come to this uh, concept in details, but the main point is that uh, each user uses its unique code okay and and then they can use these codes to send their data okay so let's uh, look into the details of, uh, of spread spectrum <coughs> and then we will see how cdma uses the concepts of spread spectrum by using <coughs> those codes so <coughs> So in general, spread spectrum is a technology where the input is fed into a channel encoder which produces analog signal with narrow bandwidth, okay? And the signal is further modulated using a sequence of digits. So, and, and that sequence is called spreading code or spreading sequence. And, uh, and they are generated by pseudo noise or pseudo random number generators. Uh, so we will come to uh, what, what is meant by pseudo noise or pseudo random number generator. And, 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 and the effect of modulation is to increase the bandwidth of the signal to be transmitted. So spread spectrum actually um, on top of the modulation, it all it, it is used uh, as an additional means to further uh, increase the bandwidth of the signal, uh, and, and and that is why it is called spread because you, you, your signal is like this. Let's say, let's say this is the spectrum of the signal. If you use sp uh, spread spectrum, the signal will be spread. Okay, like this, the bandwidth will be spread further. So that's why it's called spread spectrum. And the spreading is done just by multiplying the signal with a spreading code or a spreading sequence, okay? And the spreading sequence is generated using a pseudo random number generator. And so let's, uh, let's move on and we will come to the details of this uh, uh, gradually. So this is the general model of spread spectrum digital communication system. So you have your input data, which goes through a channel encoder and then that is modulated. And on top of the modulation, okay, the modulation can be amplitude, shift key, phase shift key, frequency shift key, whatever. Uh, but on top of that, you are also generating a spreading code by using a pseudo noise generator and then you are you are using the spreading code to further spread the signal and then you send it through the channel in the demodulator you are using the same spreading code and and then you are uh, getting back the original modulated signal which you are demodulating and then passing it through the channel decoder to get the output data. So the spreading code is generated using an arrangement like this. So you have certain shift registers um, that you can use um, in an arrangement uh, like this and, and the output sequence Okay, so at, 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 at each clock, then these, these numbers inside these registers will shift and the output sequence will be after the first three clocks, since we have three 
flip flops after the first three clocks we have the we have the shifted version of all these three registers okay and then from the fourth clock onwards this modulo to adder operation will happen uh, with the output of S, uh, S1 and S3 and then that will be fed here and then those will be shifted back so after the four after the third clock whatever is output is determined by this uh, this feedback and modulo to addition and then you will get a sequence like this uh, you can verify 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 and then that will repeat again 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 and so on so th there is a repetition of the same pattern okay and the pattern is 0 0 1 1 1 one zero one. So based on how many shift registers are here and what is this connectivity that you are using, you will get an unique pattern like this. And the number, I mean the length of the pattern will depend on the number of shift registers. So here we have three shift registers. So the length will be seven or two to the power three minus one. So you can see the length is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and then it repeats again. So, so this type of sequence is called uh, pseudo noise sequence or PN sequence. And these sequences are used as spreading code. Okay. And in CDMA, you use different sequences like this, different PN sequences, which are orthogonal to each other and unique for each user. So each user uses a different PN sequence to spread it, its own signal and send it over the channel. So in that way, uh, as if each user is encrypting its messages with a PN sequence that is unique to that user and in the receiver, the receiver knows these PN sequences and they can decrypt uh, the user's messages. Okay, so CDMA works on this principle. So it works on the principle of spreading and then despreading and, and the spreading code that is used is unique for different users. So let's uh, let's focus a little bit more on this concepts of pn sequences so as i showed you in the previous slide uh, with the shift register arrangement so this is a general uh, structure of, of of generating a pn sequence so you have several uh, shift register denoted by si0 s i m minus 3 m minus 2 and up to m minus 1 so basically this arrangement um, <clears throat> of m shift register so you have between 0 to m minus 1 so that means uh, you have uh, including this you have m shift registers right so you have m shift registers between 0 to m minus 1 okay or rather between 0 to m minus 1 okay you have m shift registers and they are connected like this with with a kind of feedback and modulo 2 additions okay so these are the modulo 2 additions and then here you have different switches okay and if you want to uh, write down the generator polynomial of this PN sequence, then this will be written in this way. And if one of these switches uh, is closed, that means this G, that particular G, uh, that particular GI is 1. If the switch is open, then that GI is 0. So you can see G0 is this one so this is always of close so g0 is always equal to 1 gm is this line so this is also always closed 
so gm is also always equal to 1 and depending on whether these switches are closed or open you will have a value for G, the particular gi so let's say if this switch is closed then gm minus 1 will be 1 okay if it is open then gm minus 1 will be 0 so in that way you can write a generator polynomial the highest degree of the polynomial is m okay so x to the power m and that uh, corresponds to the total number of shift registers that you have okay so so the output sequence that comes out from this ci has a recurrence condition according to gx the generator polynomial and that recurrence condition is given by this expression okay so so let's say if your shift register all these m shift registers are loaded with some initial bits okay so the first m minus 1 clocks will give you the output that are equal to these uh, initial loaded values in the shift registers after from the m minus 1th clock from the mth clock onwards the c i plus m is given by this recurrence relation so c i plus m is a function of c i to c i plus m minus 1 okay so <coughs> So, uh, so the, whatever is the output here is determined by this recurrence relation. So the first C i to C i plus m minus 1 will be the, the contents of this shift register. So let us say if you have a initially if you have a 0 here the first clock will input uh, will output a 0 here and then whatever is here let us say 1 that is shifted uh, onwards unless it goes here and then comes out as an output okay so basically all the initial state of this shift registers will be output first and then after the m minus 1th cycle uh, or from the mth cycle onwards uh, the output will have a recurrence relation of the previous c i to c i plus m minus 1 output because of this um, because of this circuit this modulo to additions and this and the switches that are either closed or open okay and and that uh, state is determined by this uh, generator polynomial okay so let's do an example to to get it more clear so let's say we have four shift registers si0 to si3 and we have only one of these as as fully connected okay so the other let's say the other switches here are open okay so here we have all these open so g0 is this one this is g1 this is g2 this is g3 and this is g4 okay so g0 and g4 is always connected so those are g0 is 1 and g4 is 1 but according to this arrangement we have g1 equal to 0 g2 equal to 0 and g3 equal to 1 okay so the generator polynomial will be x to the power 4 plus x cube plus 1 okay because you have g4 equal to 1 g3 equal to 1 so uh, g since g4 is 1 um, because of, of this your x to the power 4 is here in this expression your g3 is 1 so x to the power 3 is present but all all are 0 so all the other terms of x are non-existent here and then you have g0 which is also 1 so the generator polynomial is x to the power 4 plus x to the power 3 plus 1 and then uh, so these are your g all the gi's which I, I have already written and then let's assume that your initial state within this shift registers are like this given by this 
line so let's say si0 is 1 si1 is 0 si2 is 0 and si3 is 1 okay so let's assume that this is your initial state okay so you will have you will have ci equal to 1 because this one will be output here okay and then this 0 will be shifted here this 0 will be shifted here okay this one will be shifted here so so ci plus 1 will be 0 okay because this 0 is shifted here and then that's going out okay c i plus 2 will be 0 uh, and then c i plus 3 will be 1 and then from c i plus 4 onwards you can use the recurrence uh, relation okay so so okay uh, let's say uh, let's say c let's say i is 0 okay so c0 is 1 as i said okay c1 is 0 c2 is 0 and c3 is 1 okay so let's assume that uh, so i is the general uh, general uh, notation so let's say the initial uh, uh, initial stage is i equal to 0 so c0 is 1 c1 is 0 c2 is 0 and c3 is 1 and then from the next uh, relation okay so from the next relation from c4 onwards you can use the recurrence relation okay so for this particular case the recurrence relation is g3 c3 plus g2 c2 plus g1 c1 plus c0 and all these additions are modulo 2 additions so this is in in consistence with what we saw here okay so this is the recurrence relation for a general i and m for this particular case we have c4 uh, equal to g3 c3 plus g2 c2 plus g1 c1 plus c0 and then we know the values of all this uh, c0 to c3 okay and we also know the values of g0 to g4 so we can substitute those and use modulo to addition to find out c4 equal to 0 continuing in this manner we get c5 equal to 0 c6 equal to 0 c7 equal to 1 c8 equal to 1 c9 equal to 1 c10 equal to 1 c11 equal to 0 c12 equal to 1 c13 equal to 0 c14 equal to 1 and c15 equal to 1 and then you can write the sequence like this so starting from c0 you can write and then if you keep continuing like this you will find that uh, this sequence repeats after uh, after uh, c15 okay so therefore the period is 15 here okay so after every 15 bits this sequence will repeat itself so which is again consistent with the fact that you have four shift registers so basically you have 2 to the, two to the power 4 minus 1 that is 15 as the period of this pn sequence okay so as many shift registers 2 to the power that minus 1 will give you the period of the sequence so a uh, little more about pn sequences uh, so this is uh, uh, something to do with the properties of pn sequence so if you find out the autocorrelation function of a pn sequence which is basically uh, the correlation of the pn sequence with itself uh, with a shifted um, version of it so if you do ci multiplied by ci plus n and then you sum it over all i um, and then divide with the period then you get the autocorrelation function for a particular shift n okay so this will give you 
R C L. Okay. So you can you can you can calculate R C N for different values of the small n, and you will if you plot it, you will find a graph like this. Okay. So <clears throat> at zero, n equal to zero, you will find a very sharp peak, and for between zero to T C, okay. And T C is the duration of each particular uh, bit in this P N sequence. Okay, this is sometimes called chip duration. So between zero to T C, you will find uh, the graph looks like a straight line with uh, falling like this. Okay, then from T C to you know um, n minus one T C. Okay, this is n minus one T C. If the value is uh, minus one by n, okay. So this is minus one by n, or in other words, this width is one over n, where n is the period of the PN sequence. And then uh, again, it repeats at n T C. You will again find a sharp peak like this. and then it's a periodic autocorrelation function okay so um so you can see that if you make n the period of the pn sequence very large okay then uh, let's say n in this diagram if you see n if you make n tends to infinity okay then this will be and and t if if tc is very small let's say if tc tends to 0 then this autocorrelation function will look like a just an unit impulse at zero okay so this this width will be narrowing down if you make tc tends to zero and if you make n tends to infinity then this 1 over n thing uh, closes in okay and it becomes uh, aligned with this line and this peaks they move farther apart okay because they are repeating at every n tc okay so this uh, this will be moving farther apart and it it will look like the power uh, sorry the autocorrelation function of white noise right so so with this assumption like Uh, if t c tends to zero and n tends to infinity, the autocorrelation function of a p n sequence looks like a white noise. So that's why it is called pseudo noise. Since p n stands for pseudo noise, so this is not quite uh, uh, the noise, but it's pseudo noise. So the the term pseudo means false. Okay. so this uh, sequence if you make n very large or the number of chip registers very large so that the period of the pn sequence is very large then this behaves almost like a white noise okay in a limiting sense and and therefore uh, it's very difficult to decode or 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 you know to break this code for pn sequences so if you are using a pn sequence uh, very large to encrypt your data then it becomes very difficult to you know uh, break the code and that's what is used in practical cdma systems uh, one uses a very large pn sequence uh, of the order of let's say you know uh, 63 or 127 So this is basically two to the power six minus one. This is two to the power seven minus one. So you use a six uh, shift register system or a seven shift register system, and then you can have um, a PN sequence which is almost behaving like a noise. And the power spectral density also, if you make n very large, this will be looking like a very Flat power spectral density. Okay, 
so this is this is similar this this would look similar to the power spectral density of white noise which is a flat uh, uh, flat curve uh, fixed at n0 by 2 so this is the concept of pn sequence that is used for spread spectrum uh, communications and cdma systems okay so uh, going back to spread spectrum on the receiving end the digital sequence is used to demodulate the spread spectrum signal and the signal is fed into a channel decoder to recover the data now the question is what can be gained from this apparent waste of spectrum okay you are spreading the spectrum and making it uh, making it occupy a very large space so what can be gained the gain is basically immunity from various kinds of noise and multipath distortion and it can be used for hiding and encrypting signals as i just said and several users can independently use the same higher bandwidth with very little interference so let's uh, let's uh, see uh, why we use spread spectrum uh, from this from this picture so let's say you have uh, you have this uh, a spreaded signal okay so let's say this is the original signal which after modulating uh, with the pn sequence it gets spreaded and it looks like this okay so now imagine that there is a jammer signal okay jammer means uh, an external signal which is trying to you know um, destroy your signal by sending a very high power signal at a, at a certain frequency let's say okay let's say this is fj the frequency of the jammer so this is a very high power signal at you, as you can see a very sharp spike at a particular frequency so this is a jammer signal which is trying to the you know eavesdrop to your system and trying to you know uh, mess with your system let's say so when you are detecting this at the receiver at the receiver what is happening is that you are multiplying the original spreaded signal this this blue spectrum with the same pn sequence right if you go back a few slides back let's say here in the receiver you are multiplying with the same pn uh, sequence the same spreading code to get back the original spreaded signal so so let's say in the in the receiver when you are detecting you are multiplying the original signal with the same pn sequence so now that multiplication at the receiver behaves like a de spreading so the original signal will get back to its shape okay this is the original spectrum of the original signal but this jamming signal which was added in between in the channel that gets spreaded because of this uh, re multiplying with the spreading code so this is this is very fun uh, the original signal which was already spreaded that gets despreaded but the interference signal or the jammer signal that gets spreaded the original signal gets despreaded sorry the original signal gets despreaded but the jamming signal gets spreaded now if you use a bandpass filter like this centered around the frequencies of the original signal then this original signal will be treated as the actual signal and whatever power that you have for the jamming signal which is now spreaded this will be very low compared to the original signal and this will be treated as uh, interference or noise okay so you will have a high signal to interference plus noise ratio and you can detect the original signal by treating the interference as a very low power uh, noise or interference okay so this is the beauty of using spread spectrum so so moving on uh, 
let's look into the different types of spread spectrum. So the first one is called the frequency hopping spread spectrum. Okay. So <clears throat> you have come across this frequency hopping spread spectrum before when you were studying Bluetooth. So we will talk about this frequency hopping again, uh, but into, into more details. So in frequency hopping spread spectrum, the signal is broadcast over seemingly random series of radio frequencies. Okay. A number of channels are allocated for the frequency hop signal and the width of each channel corresponds to bandwidth of the input signal. And the signal hops from one frequency to, frequency to another at fixed intervals. So the transmitter operates in one channel at a time and then the bits are transmitted using some encoding scheme and at each successive interval a new carrier frequency is selected. Okay, so I'll stop here for this video and then I will resume with the details of the frequency hopping and the further topics in this lecture note uh, in the next video. So I'll stop here.